Welcome to a special late night, no makeup edition of Seek at Home. This week, I had our regularly scheduled plan nearly completed. And then on Friday, the news broke that for many of us, felt like a punch to the stomach. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Associate Supreme Court Justice of 27 years, champion of minority and women's rights, died after a battle with pancreatic cancer. It's a blow and it's been a tough pill to swallow. I decided that if this moment in history was affecting any of our ethical households the way it's been affecting mine, maybe we should do some seeking about it. Saturday morning, I started from scratch and came up with this episode of Seek at Home that honors Ruth Bader Ginsburg's legacy and gives us time to reflect on the ways that the judicial system and ethics collide. I'm hoping this episode will give us some new insights into ourselves and into the notorious RBG. By 1993, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg was appointed to the Supreme Court as the 107th Justice, but only the second female, she had a lifetime of Jewish learning and forming her values and decision-making. But it had also been in Judaism, where her first-hand experience with exclusion based on her gender laid the foundation for her judicial passion. As a teenager, she found herself prohibited from participating in traditional Jewish mourning rites when her mother died. That incident was the catalyst for Ruth to reject the theological aspects of her Jewish identity. She began living her life intentionally free of religious ritual and dogma, and focused her work on civic issues like social justice and discrimination, and equity promoted by the Jewish tenet of tikkun olam. Many people in our congregation can relate to Ruth's alienating religious experience. And we certainly know that the founder of ethical humanism, Felix Adler, felt the same way when he stood before his father's reformed Jewish congregation and announced the, quote, need for a religion without the trappings of ritual or creed that united all of mankind in moral social action. In my estimation, Ruth probably would have gotten along great here at the Ethical Society. So aside from this perilous position that her absence leaves our civil rights in and the anxiety that many of us are feeling over a new appointee, I think the grief is extra hard for me and for maybe some of you, because Ruth Bader Ginsburg was one of the few people in politics whose values are so closely aligned with our own as ethical humanists. It kind of feels like we lost our voice. Ginsburg is often hailed as a champion for women's rights, but she fought for the rights of minorities of all kinds. Whether her side of the argument won or lost the hearing, she's considered a pivotal component of several landmark cases. And here are just a few. United States versus Virginia, 1996. At the start of 1996, the Virginia Military Institute was the country's last remaining all-male public undergraduate college. The United States filed a suit against the school, arguing that the gender exclusive admissions policy violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. The case reached the Supreme Court, where the state of Virginia argued not only that women weren't properly suited for VMI's rigorous training, but also that the state's creation of a separate military program at a nearby women's only liberal arts school was sufficiently equal. The court disagreed and struck down VMI's all-male admissions policy, with Ginsburg writing the majority opinion making it clear that gender equality is a constitutional right. Obergefell v. Hodges, 2015. That case granted same-sex couples the right to marry in all 50 states. As a former officiant of same-sex weddings and an advocate for LGBTQ rights, it's believed that Ginsburg's outspokenness affected public opinion. Ledbetter v. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, 2007, focused on the case of Lily Ledbetter, who sued her employer of 19 years, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, for gender discrimination after she discovered the company had been paying her less than her male counterparts. Ledbetter argued the pay disparity was due to her gender and a violation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Goodyear countered that the same clause required discrimination complaints to be filed within 180 days of the decision to pay her less money than the men. The Supreme Court abided by that rule and voted 5-4 to four in favor of Goodyear. Ginsburg wrote the dissenting opinion, pointing out the fact that Ledbetter couldn't have filed her complaint sooner because she didn't know she was being discriminated against. And Ginsburg didn't just quietly file her dissent with a clerk, which is the usual procedure. Instead, 
She translated the official technical document into a more widely understandable version, which she read publicly from the bench, making sure the gender wage gap got plenty of public attention. She continued to press Congress to amend the clause, which they eventually did. When President Barack Obama took office in 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act was the first bill he signed. Even though her incredible achievements might make RBG seem like a giant, she was actually a really tiny woman sitting on a bench primarily composed of large men. Desiring a way to carve out a visual space of their own, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female Supreme Court justice, jointly decided that they would use jabots to distinguish themselves in what would otherwise be the sea of black robes and ties. Quote, you know, the standard robe is made for a man because it has a place for the shirt to show and the tie. So Sandra Day O'Connor and I thought it would be appropriate if we included as part of our robe something typical of a woman, Ginsburg told the Washington Post. Before long, Ruth found herself with dozens of jabots, collars, necklaces, anything that goes around the neck. But on days when the court made a decision, she knew exactly what she was going to wear. When her opinion was with the court majority, she would wear this lace collar featuring gold trim and charms, a favorite collar given to her by a former clerk. When her opinion fell in the court's minority, she wore this mirrored bib necklace, not for any sentimental reasons, but strictly because, quote, it looks fitting for dissent. And this is not the first time I've been wowed by RBG's fierce fashion. This collar has become widely known as the Descent Collar, and because of Ruth's renowned scathing commentary in her written Descent opinions, it's this collar that's launched a thousand replicas as a rally symbol for women who've had enough with systematic that discrimination. That brings us to our activity for the week. If you were a judge and had to wear a robe just like all the other judges, what would your trademark accessory be? What special something would you wear to stand out from the crowd? Think on that, and then it's time to get the whole household together for craft night. Gather around to draw, sew, or otherwise craft your accessories from paper, cloth scraps, or whatever other crafting materials you find around the house. While you work on your accessory, consider what issue you would focus on if you were a judge, and see if it might inspire your design. For example, feminist issues were especially important to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the item that she chose to stand out was chosen specifically because of its femininity. Whatever your issue of choice is, see if your special accessory can reflect it in some way. But don't get too hung up on picking the perfect issue. Maybe you'll go big, like gender inequality or immigrant rights or gun violence. Maybe you'll take on something that affects you more directly, like the amount of air in potato chip bags, or that you believe you should be free to not clean your room, or that Taco Bell should bring back the Mexican pizza. As silly as these might seem, no topic is too small because every great big issue we have in society is made of a million smaller ones. In fact, Ruth Bader Ginsburg liked starting with the small problems and working her way up to the Ginsburg big ones. Ginsburg believed that the most effective way to achieve lasting results was to pick smaller, winnable cases that would set precedent to chip away at the legal barriers imposed on women. In this way, bit by bit, Ginsburg could construct an unshakable legal foundation for women's equality which would hold until society was ready to pass a more sweeping measure, say an equal rights amendment, explicitly banning gender discrimination. So if you decide to back an issue that you're not sure is important enough, there's a really good chance that a solution to your problem could be a building block to something much bigger. As always, we wanna see your progress and get to know your passions. Send an email to seek at ethicalstl.org and I'll get you the instructions on how to submit your projects. Your submissions will be featured in future videos. Speaking of that, last week's challenge was to do some personal archeology span and show us your memorabilia. We have some great entries I can't wait to show you, but since this episode rather abruptly took the place of our regularly scheduled programming, we'll have to show you those next time. But hey, the great news is now, if you haven't done that one, you have another week to submit your personal archeology span projects. All RBG and personal archaeology projects submitted by Friday, September 25th are eligible for some very cool Ethical Society swag. For more information on Seek at Home, check out the Seek Facebook page, the weekly e-blasts, and monthly connections. If you don't get those emails, send me a message at seek at ethicalstl.org and we'll get you sorted out. Thanks for joining us today. You, the family and friends of the Ethical Society, are our heart and soul. We couldn't do what we do without you. See you next week.